we could collapse this boom a little bit and orient the mic in between the two of us. This is Omni. It, it'll go anywhere, and there's no proximity effect, so we don't have to worry about, about where it is. Um, well, the Stan Getz and um, Charlie Bird album was the first Bossa Nova recording, which Ed Green, I was working for Ed at the time, we, he got the contract from MGM to uh, do it. And that was uh, called Jazz Samba, and it ended up going coming out on Verve. And that was in 1963, if I remember. It was in a church social hall kind of a place in downtown Washington. Reasonably good acoustics, pretty quiet, and eight microphones. And that's because the mixer had eight inputs. So you want nine, you're up the creek. And... Anyway, it was all vacuum tubes. It was vacuum tube uh, Ampex 350s. We were running either Scotch 111 or Scotch 611 uh, red oxide tape. And this the gig went, I think it went two nights. Because uh, I, I forget the exact timetable, but anyway. And, and that made history. It was on the top of the charts for months. And uh, the jazz station here did a survey of the top 100 jazz recordings of all time. And this came in number three, which I thought was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Cats like that just swinging their brains out, basically. Uh, uh, it, it was awesome. And then we did, uh, about the same time, within two or three years, we did Ramsey Lewis and uh, Ahmad Jamal at a nightclub a little further out from downtown called the Bohemian Caverns. And it had been around since, um, I think, before the Second World War. And it had sort of turned into a hippie joint. But uh, that was a lot of fun. And I have uh, copies of both outtakes and the masters on both of those. The, the Getz uh, album that you heard was a copy of the Cutting Master, which had a little high-end EQ cranked in, and that was probably four generations down from the original. And uh, that MGM gave me a copy of that. And we were pretty good friends with the head honcho there at the time. Uh, we did work with the National Symphony Orchestra, uh, in particular a recording of Carl Orff's uh, Carmen of Burana. This was done at Constitution Hall in D.C., which is a big square room, seats about 2,500 people around three sides. Boomy at the low end, but a nice reverb tail. And for that one, there was a pair of C-37s XY flown over the conductor, some woodwind and fill uh, two or three solo mics and a pair of 47s wide spaced in a house. And that's, and oh, and that one was recorded over telephone lines. We got a, a f pair, a matched pair of 15K lines. And we were doing this live to air for WGMS, which is a local good music station down there. But we were also running tape in the background. And so this is a first generation copy of the, the backup tape that we did. Uh, quote, air check, unquote. Tape machines were back at the studio, which is about two miles away. There was a central office in there someplace, and they got a little ugly to start with, so about the first 10 or 12 minutes, you can hear there's some pretty hairy distortion going on. But after that, it's amazing, and the dynamic range that we got was not to be believed for that, that era. And the musicianship was great, and they had some absolutely amazing soloists. I have no, well, I have some documentation. It was done, I think the conductor of the NSO at that point was Hans Kindler, if I remember. There was a 200-voice choir that was made up of church choirs and four or five soloists, uh, including this bass solo. His voice was just stand your hair up when you hear it. That was fun. We did the Lincoln portrait outside the Smithsonian on the steps, believe it or not, um, with Adelaide Stevenson, the, narr the narrator. 
we did a recording of a piece called, or a suite called The Confederacy, which I also have. That was done inside the uh, East Garden Court of the, of the Art Gallery down there. Live to two, again, eight microphones. That's, that's all we had, you know. And uh, a couple of two-track 350s that I seriously beat on. These were hot-rotted quite a bit more than what most studios were doing at the time. Uh, we recapped them with much better capacitors than they had to start with. And we had uh, access to an intermod meter. And what we discovered uh, is that the 350 with the red oxide tape, you want to set the bias for peak plus 5 at 1 kilohertz. So it's 5 dB over bias past wherever the sensitivity peak is, and that got the IM down to a negligible number, kind of given that you're dealing with analog tape. Um, and uh, then, you know, very uh, I modified the record EQ because it was a little bit energetic for, because the, the, that machine was designed for 1952 vintage tape, and this is uh, mid-60s we're talking about. So... They were really good machines, and I have one downstairs that's going to get the same treatment. Ampex didn't know and couldn't care. I mean, uh, the they say feed in a 1K tone and, and tweak the bias until you get a peak in the, in the level, and that's it. The problem is the record EQ with no overbias was just way up there. And the overbias took care of some of the high end, but then I had to get in and modify the record EQ to get it flat. And I think those machines were pretty much flat out to 21 or 22 kilohertz at 15 ips. And um, anyway, we we did some really good work with those machines. It, it uh, you know they were vacuum tubes, and occasionally they'd get crazy, and you'd have to hand pick tubes. And I know we bought. Somewhere surplus, we bought about 112 SJ7s because that's mainly what the mixer had, or what the machines had, and we handpicked the ones that were the quietest. What made those recordings so good? Well, I would say at least for the, the 47s and probably the 49, there was an upward tilt at the high end. They weren't real flat, and if you ever took a Neumann a uh, 47 or 49 into an anechoic chamber and ran some curves on it, which Floyd Toole did. He said, you would absolutely die if you think speakers are bad. You should see what these microphones do. Part of the magic potion was the fact that vacuum tubes run on very high voltages. And I know all the stuff I built for Ed, the mic preamps would put out a minimum of plus 30 into a 100K load before I could measure the distortion. Now that's that's the equivalent of one watt if it was 600 ohms, and it was all vacuum tubes. It was unbalanced except for the mic inputs, and so you're talking lots and lots and lots of headroom. The mixer was uh, a Casco 12 BK7 with big hunk of chunk of UTC input and output transformer. So it was mic in, eight in, a mix bus, a passive mix bus. There was to the left, right, and ascend, and uh, then it came back out mic level, and it went into the Ampex through its big hunk of chunk of transformers at mic level. So by the time you got through with the gig, the sound had gone through probably a dozen or more transformers per channel, and that's what you heard. So anybody that says the transformers are a bad idea is uh, not with it, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, that was then, this is now. I mean, Transformers got a bum rap back in the early 70s when they started making Transformers that were not even good paperweights. And they went cheap, 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 because, you know, the bean counters are running the show. And um, Transformers are fine, and if you need something to stop a hum, and that's all you've got, I'll take a clean feed with a Transformer in it any day over a, a dirty feed. That was the setup. Ed had a couple of 47s. He had an M49. He had a pair of C37s that were mine originally. I sold them to him. He had some 451s. 
and uh, then he had he had some 655s which is a big long uh, EV Omni with a UA connector on the back and, and it was a broadcast mic but it was about like this you know sort of like a billy club and they were very good and he had a bunch of 635s which is this is a knockoff of the 635. With a 47's tube? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I mean this is all vacuum. No. This is with the old Tuchel connectors and the power supplies and the whole and we had to we had to beat up on them a good bit. And that was back when Gotham Audio was the Neumann distributor for the world or for North America anyway. And uh, we discovered the hard way that you don't want to tell them what you've done even if it made an improvement, because Temmer would go ballistic, Stephen Temmer, and uh, there's a long series of stories there, but anyway, he was, he was known by none less than guys like Phil Ramone as the Nazi, and it turned out he went to a Hitler youth camp in Austria before he moved over here, and I, I hate to cast words of disparagement against those of us who aren't here anymore but oi 